I would like to hand off the hosting duties to Ness Murby, dad, husband, Paralympian, and unapologetically trans. Ness Murby is a counselor, inclusion strategist, independent consultant, and the co-founder of Tougher Den. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to get to speak uh, to yourselves this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so uh, give me one moment. Technology, it never ceases to surprise me. Okay. And I would, let's see, I think I'm on there. And then, there we go. I would start by saying, do you all see what I see? But I think that's um, probably a redundant question considering I'm blind. Um, so let us uh, see if it's actually going to work. There we go. Yes. All right. Seen. There you go. Excellent. Um, so welcome to my session on authentic inclusion. My name's Ness. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, this evening, I am wearing a blue collared shirt and uh, square framed red mirrored sunglasses. And I'm actually using uh, headphones, uh, white headphones that are connected into an iPad this evening. My background is a wall with a artist uh, rendition of um, a Hong Kong streetscape um, that I have behind me. And um, this is me. So authentic inclusion 101. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm situated on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sailortooth nations. I'm actually uh, calling in from uh, Coquitlam uh, in British Columbia. And I thought I'd start by uh, explaining a little bit about land acknowledgements. Um, why do we use land acknowledgements? Well, acknowledging the land is a way to express gratitude for those who reside on the land and uh, honor the indigenous people who have lived and worked on the land uh, historically and presently. Presently. And that's sort of um, a key thing when we think about inclusion is working out how we can honor each person as a human in history and in future. So I'd like to move on to starting with inclusion. I think we all have an idea of what inclusion means, but let's check out the Merriam and Webster dictionary because, hey, that's always a great place to start. So inclusion, the action or state of including or of being included within a group or structure, the practice or policy of providing equal access to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. It's really good when we start with definitions, but what does it mean when we unpack things? So I'm going to ask each of you to journey with me in a little bit of an exercise here. I'm gonna read out a few statements. And in each statement, I want you to spend a few, a few seconds, a few moments, considering whether they apply to you as an individual in your lived experience. I can turn on the television or look at a magazine and see people that look and sound like me. I can turn on the television or look at a magazine and I can see people that look and sound like me. I can, if I wish, be in the company of people who share my views most of the time. I can, if I wish, be in the company of people who share my views most of the time. When I am told about our national heritage or about civilization, I am shown that people like me made it what it is. When I'm told about our national heritage or about civilization, I'm shown that people like me made it what it is. I can travel to new places, meet new people and feel somewhat connected, heard and valued. I can travel to new places, meet new people and feel somewhat connected, heard and valued. I can choose public accommodations without fearing that I won't be allowed in or will be mistreated in the place that I've chosen. I can choose public accommodations without fearing, fearing that I won't be allowed in or will be mistreated in the place that I've chosen. I can show my ID upon request without risking my safety. 
I can show my ID upon request without risking my safety. I can ask for help and know that I am likely to receive it. I can ask for help and know that I am likely to receive it. Who I am has never been debated by a panel of people. Who I am has never been debated by a panel of people. I'm Ness Murby. All of those statements are untrue for me. And that is the very essence of inclusion, why inclusion matters. So my lens, I'm a dad, a husband, a son. I'm grandkid always, even in her Alzheimer's. I'm Pops Tiger, even from heaven. I'm Australian born, mixed Aboriginal and colonial descent. Hong Kong raised me. I'm a settler to Canada. I'm blind, transgender, a counselor, a consultant, a co-founder of Tougher Than, a Paralympian. I'm an extroverted introvert. I'm an activist, a believer, a leader, a carrier of responsibility. And my title, my title is someone because I believe in being someone when they say that someone needs to do something and I'm going to try my best. So when I talk about me, I guess I could start with, I was born with a rare congenital eye condition. My sight was dramatically affected by glare. And so I experienced a lot of sudden, sorry, sudden blindness, depending on my environment. Overall, I went from having low vision to no vision as a teenager. For me, this ever-changing aspect of my sight was like a bit of an inbuilt curiosity or an adaptability puzzle. Um, and what I guess it was my way of accepting it was learning how to thrive with it and realizing that the idea of typical is so incredibly relative. Oh, and contrary to popular stereotypes, I'm actually really good at giving directions. One of my superpowers, I think. So I could talk about my ever-expanding list of credentials or the fact that they're a product of my intersectional oppression. Or I could tell you my grades and accolades, the world records and history-making markers. But I like to talk about my lens because who I am is the combination and product of my unique lived experience. And there is no label for anyone's lived experience. <clears throat> Most of us are comforted by a little, if not a lot, of sameness. Sometimes I like to bring into spaces this reminder that sameness doesn't always look how you imagine it to. Instead, I like to think of finding comfort in connection. So a little about me that's not popularly known. I also was raised in the country. So I grew up in what's called the Snowy Riverman country. Ned Kelly country, horseback country, home of the Akubra and belonging to the Blundstones. Yes, I am an original Aussie. And so I remember the fear and exhilaration of cantering across uh, the dry plains, integrating jumps in an arena juxtaposed to cantering over high country landscapes and <clears throat> high country landscapes underfoot and encompassing gum trees, bark, fallen trees, logs, and the trotting over tree trunks only to duck under branches as we go. Watch out, whoops, where was that coming from? Hold on tight, heels down, come on, giddy up. So there was mud and there was up and there was over, there were summits and I've fallen. I've fallen hard too. And I still remember the one that stays with me. I think everyone has one of those. It's that fall where you wonder if you will get back on the horse. This one, the actual incident wasn't so dramatic, but it's interesting it stayed with me. My horse just tripped. It tripped on a downward embankment unexpectedly, and my feet lifted up with the stirrups getting hooked and locked over the saddle flaps. Felt like it was an age. I was hanging there thinking, get them down, get them down, and they're hooked. And then the next moment, I'm rolling. I'm rolling forwards, and I'm sliding down Big Chief's neck straight headfirst onto the hard ground. Might I remind you that this was Big Chief. He was over 20 hands tall, and I felt somewhat intimidated. And as I stood up and looked around, I recognized I was a good deal many paddocks from any stable whatsoever, and I was going to need to get back on. 
So I felt the fear creep in and the awareness of this majestic animal in front of me. Stables far away. And I got back on and we rode the next half an hour working in tandem, promising each other, I'm sure, that that won't happen again. So when I think of horse riding, I think of this and I think of hours spent trying to get my heels down. That was definitely catalyzed by this accident. And I'm here to tell you that to this day, I have very poor calf flexibility. No matter how many stools I've sat on, no matter how many bars and steps I've leant down in. And this is where I say to you that connection isn't a label we wear on the outside. Connection is something we share as humans. So let's talk a little bit about that intersectionality, that power and privilege piece that I brought to the table in the beginning. We are all the sum of our parts. And like the layers of the earth, we are more than what you see on the surface. Intersectionality matters because it is this, our intersectionality, that is our wholeness, our authentic self, intersectionality speaks and inclusion must answer the very same people who accepted me for who they thought I was reject me for who they have decided I am in the face of labels, not in knowing who I am as a white presenting male. I am afforded much privilege as a blind transgender man. I face a lack of fundamental safety in my day to day life. In spaces where my disability is accepted, my gender identity is not, and very much vice versa. So in 2020, I came out as the first openly trans Paralympian, and the silence was overwhelmingly loud. Silence is not neutrality. It's not neutral, but we'll come back to that. I face a lack of fundamental safety on a day-to-day -day basis because as a trans person, and as a blind person separately, but because together this creates an additional facet of danger. The ad then add in sport competitions are held in countries where it's illegal to be queer. And that is definitely a concrete example of some of the challenges I face. And part of this challenge exists because it's the irony of my intersectionality. As a Paralympian, I have a privileged platform. And as a blind person, I'm marginalized and discriminated against. And well, hey, as a trans person, people seek to erase my existence. It's a bit ironic when you think about it. Labels. Labels do not define who we are, and they cannot connect us as humans. Authentic inclusion. I borrowed this definition from an organization called And Humanity. Inclusion is an active, intentional, and continuous process to address inequities in power and privilege and to build a respectful and diverse community that ensures welcoming spaces and opportunities to flourish for all. It requires deliberate and intentional action. For example, an organization that is able to authentically resonate with its community and ensure that they feel reflected and seen in the work the organization is doing, both in the public eye as well as internally. Authentic inclusion matters. And that's because authentic inclusion helps. It helps to minimize harm and erasure. It shapes norms. It acknowledges different perspectives and multiple truths. It builds community and fosters safety. And when I think about my stories of inclusion, there are a lot of things that could have been done differently that would have made me feel welcome. So I mentioned I'm originally an Aussie. I immigrated to Canada in 2012 after I had left uh, Tokyo to evacuate from the um, Great Tohoku earthquake of uh, 2011. And at the time I was there with my now wife and my guide dog, my first guide dog, who suffered PTSD from the earthquakes. And so we needed to evacuate. And we came to Canada because Canada is safer for the LGBTQ plus community, or at least it was. Australia hadn't legalized gay marriage or rights. And so we moved to Canada, we moved to BC. It wasn't my first time there. I'd been to Vancouver in 2004 
And I knew the West End pretty much by memory. So again, I felt like there was inclusion for being a blind person, inclusion for being queer. So we moved, we immigrated, and I uh, went through the process of my permanent residency. Now, becoming a Canadian, part of becoming a Canadian involves doing medical tests. So on this one fated day, my wife and I walked down the street to the government office to go and attend a medical import a medical appointment whereby I would be told if I was fit to be a Canadian. When we got there, we sat in a waiting room and the uh, sat for quite some time, actually, when you think about it. Now, when I think back, I'm like, yeah, we waited with patience for me to be included into Canadian society. About a 45 minute to an hour and a half later, I was taken into the room alone. My wife was not permitted to enter with me. Now, this medical professional asked me questions, um, height, weight, and then asked me what I do. I'm an elite athlete, okay, you know, and I've also done design and things. Thought we were getting on, thought we were connecting. I mean, the next question, so how blind are you? Well, I'm totally blind. There was silence. There were no more questions. This medical professional went about the rest of their, their tests quite quietly until they said, hmm, so you're totally blind. Is there anything they can do? No, there's nothing. To which the response was, we don't normally let drains on society like you into our country. But because you're applying through a family visa, my wife's Canadian, there's nothing I can do. And this is why authentic inclusion helps. Because when someone assumes what a label means, they're projecting their fears, their worries, their concerns onto you, rather than recognizing you as an individual, as a human, as a person. But I said I come with a lot of identities and a lot of labels, like we all do. So then I enter into sport. And how interesting, I'm blind. Um, <clears throat> and uh, blind uh, forevermore as I had just uh, conveyed. And I went into para sport and I became top within three different sports. I've represented three countries in three sports, Australia, Japan, and Canada, in global powerlifting and para athletics. And when it came to para athletics and I was approaching the Rio 2016 Paralympic Games, I learned that sometimes you can be too disabled for greatness. See, there's a lot of rules and hierarchy and policies in place for the running of the games. And as a high dependency athlete, meaning that I required assistance beyond just myself, meant it would require extra resources from, team, uh, from the team allocation. And so as a totally blind athlete, it would necessitate me taking my sports guide. That would take away another accreditation from Team Canada. And that was my beginning of my journey to recognize segregation within a segregated group occurs and occurs far too often. In the disabled world, even second in the world in discus, and I was too disabled to be part of our segregated disabled parasporting group. Authentic inclusion makes a difference. It minimizes harm. And when we recognize people as their individual selves, that is when we can start to not only embrace, but also champion these individual identities. Nonetheless, I went to Rio and I competed. The lessons I learned there were invaluable and I've carried forward in sport for the following uh, years that I've still remained in para-athletics. I think I'd also like to talk about then that other identity, I'm trans. And in trans, in the trans community, we're often othered it's been a history for the LGBTQ plus community of pushing through oppression and pushback. It happened in the gay community, it's happening in the trans community. And I was met with, go get your own organization. And when did this start? And how, how could you betray us as a group? Now these sound like really negative responses. And what I wanna say is, there's compassion to this because these responses are coming from a comfort zone 
We all know where we feel comfortable. We all look for sameness to keep things the way they are. But the reality is that sameness, it really only exists inside ourselves because we're projecting assumptions onto people and judgments and explaining to them how they should be rather than embracing them how they are. Silence from people invested in years of my relationship building as my identities unfolded has been one of the key takeaways, especially since coming out as trans in 2020. And that's, I told you, we'd loop back around. Silence isn't neutral. Silence isn't supportive. And when you're silence in the face of a marginalized identity of an individual who faces oppression, you are not supportive, you are not in solidarity, and you are not safe. Please don't ask people with marginalized identities to assume that you are a safe space for them when you remain silent. Authentic inclusion acknowledges different perspectives and multiple truths. Authentic inclusion can build community and foster safety. Now, I'm here talking to you today because of happen chance, because of authentic inclusion in an interesting setting. I'm here talking to you because I gave a presentation and Karina happened to be present. And in the after Q&A of that presentation, we found ourselves in a rather interesting uh, technological platform whereby I couldn't read the chat or type in it really at all. I'd say it was quite poor. And Karina's microphone wasn't working. So I'm blind and there's no audio. And Karina was unable to speak and only type. So we managed to work this out where I started speaking out into the void, wondering if I was in this room alone. And Karina's uh, fervently typing in the chat to let me know that she's there and present. And this moment of human connectivity happened whereby I tried to meet Karina where she was at and tried to get my accessible devices working so that I could type in the chat and listen to what was being chatted back at me. And Karina actually spoke up and said, you can just talk and then I'll type. And that idea of meeting each other in the middle, there was no, there was no protocol. There was no, no policy. There was just two humans authentically invested in trying to connect. And that is why authentic inclusion is really important. And it's something that comes from within ourselves. It's an intrinsic motivation. And we all desire to be seen. Each of you who are present here this evening or, or watching this webinar, we all desire and we all deserve to be seen for who we are. And that brings me to talking about intentions versus impact. When we think about intentions, intention is what you thought you were doing. And impact is how your actions were actually perceived by the other person. Intentions can be can come with a with an entire long narrative of what you thought you were doing and what you wanted to be doing. But at the end of the day, we really need to be focused on the impact of our actions on the people who are receiving what we are doing. In situations rooted in oppressive systems like racism, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, the impact can be the difference between perpetrating harm and fostering inclusion. I'm going to say that again. Impact can actually be the difference between perpetrating harm and fostering inclusion. Now, this is said by Melanie um, Tannenbaum, who said, in fact, many would say that it is inherently privileged to redirect the focus of a conversation to the perpetrator's presumably harmless intentions rather than focusing on the feelings and experiences of the person who has been harmed. So the point is that we really need to focus on impact, not intent. Was someone hurt by something? Was there a negative outcome? Did someone suffer? And if so, that is what's important. Whether or not the person meant to cause harm is not. 
And this comes back to if we can all assume that each other is doing their best, that is very different to also giving space to acknowledge when we are hurt, harmed, and affected. Because when we can talk about our impact, we can make change so that more people are feeling included and being given the opportunity to belong. So I want to start talking a little bit about othering. I have been the other many times in my life. I resonate wholeheartedly with a person who uh, shared their story. I was listening to their, their book and podcast, and I've taken my own poetic license in relaying this. I am so exhausted of being the other, they said. Just so exhausted of being an other. What, what exactly is an other? Well, like when at school you'd get picked for teams, the two popular kids, well, they'd take lead and each would list people's names. You know, I, I'd be standing there and they'd be like, Jack, Sarah, and I'd be waiting and I'd be hoping and I'd be holding my breath. And then it would be Julianne, Simon, and I'd be trying to become invisible, trying to just breathe a little softer, trying to maybe not be seen that I'm still left there. Peter, Jessica, as the names went on without me, David, Lisa, and you, you can have the others. I was an other. I wasn't picked for teams. I wasn't named. And that taught me that I was lacking something, that I wasn't enough. Enough in what? I didn't know. I didn't know why I wasn't cool enough, likable enough. Kids, kids can be cruel and kids show us in such pure honesty how we relate as a society. My identities have broadened my intersectionality is so much richer now. I have so many overlapping facets of who I am and I still feel like an other. But now I embrace myself because being me, being me is my superpower, just as being you is your superpower. Silence, when we are standing next to each other, is not neutrality because you're either inclusive or you're not. So when you exclude people, whether it's by silence or overt action, you're actually mandating that they fit in to feel safe, to be accounted for, that they fit in, that they change. You're ultimatuming them to edit themselves or risk remaining on the outer. Because belonging is being able to show up unedited. Belonging cannot be mandated or manufactured. And inclusion is essential for belonging. I want you to all take a moment and think back. Think back to a time when you were so aware that you didn't fit in. We've all had those moments, whether it's been at a networking event whether it's been at a dinner party where you feel underdressed or even overdressed, because that's the irony. We can be one end or the other of the dichotomy. There never seems to be an enough. Either we're too much or we're too little. But what if we just were? What if we just showed up as our authentic selves? And what if we just embraced each other in their unique individualism? Inclusion matters. Inclusion matters on so many levels. As a person, your words and your language, your actions, they hold power and they create impact. Consider how you're showing up for yourself and for each other, because that's part of this. We have to show up for ourselves and we have to show up for each other. Focus on the impact you have rather than your intention. Inclusion matters. Here we are at the end of Pride Month, and it's really important to recognize that Pride Month, Pride, isn't just one day. And I'm speaking to this, I'm gonna tap into that one label of my identity as a trans and queer individual and say, 
when we think about pride, often we think about it, pride as a time for celebration and sometimes as a thing for us to reflect upon how far we've come. I really feel that this year we need to be focusing on the work we still have to do. And as a member of the trans community, trans and non-binary individuals are in danger. We're in danger because we are being erased. We are having our rights taken away. And it's not just the right for sport. It's the right to live, to work, to have a family, to feel safe. Governments are debating our right to be ourselves and they're mandating legislations to control how we go about living, breathing, existing. And one of the most shocking things is that governments are leveraging and targeting one of our most vulnerable population, our kids. I'm dad to a 14-month-old kid and I have to balance what jeopardy I put my kid in because I'm being congruent with who I am. And I also have to balance waiting to hear who she, they are when they grow up and they form their own identity and they're ready to tell me, hey, dad, this is who I am. And I have to be ready to protect them in the face of danger and a lack of safety. Researchers feel that this data that I'm presenting here is significantly underrepresented. Can you imagine that? I think these numbers are shocking enough as they are, but they're significantly underrepresented because things such as safety, whether an individual has come out yet, whether parents have accepted their child for who they are and are ready to identify them as such on a census in questionnaires, Data is skewed based on safety. But let's talk about what we do know. 30% of LGBTQ plus people are living, living in Canada are under 25 years old. One, over 100,000 Canadians are trans or non-binary. And that's one in 100 people under 25 and one in 700 people over 65. I'm going to posit to you when I was met with older people in the LGBTQ community who questioned why I would come out, why I would be trans, why I would do this, I was met with people who had real fear for themselves. One in 700. That number is significantly skewed by what it means to come out. When someone identifies you as queer, it changes all your rights and access to the world. It changes who you can be involved with, who you can talk to, where you can travel to. It changes your right for credit cards and home. It changes so many things. And Alberta accounts for 12% of Canada's transgender and non-binary population. 41% of LGBTQ plus Canadians make less than 20,000 a year. Until this year, I was one of them. I couldn't get work in Canada because of my intersectionality. If it wasn't for being blind, it was for being queer. LGBTQ plus individuals are two times more likely to experience inappropriate behavior in public, online and at work. 40% of LGBTQ plus Canadians have considered suicide in their lifetime. And that is why pride is important because someone tonight, I promise you, someone tonight still believes that they'd be better off dead than being themselves, than being queer, than being gay, than being trans. Inclusion matters so much. So start being inclusive. We all have a story. My lived experience is my story. Consider your story. What will you make your legacy from your story? And when you think about where to start, why not start here? Inclusion is human centered and it's ever evolving. So be flexible, revisit it regularly and adapt. It's really not about being perfect. It's about 
making an effort and starting somewhere, committing to the journey, committing to grow. And it's about considering who may be being missed or being excluded when you're making plans, when you're running events, when you're speaking. Practice the platinum rule. I think maybe, maybe some of you, like myself, were brought up with the idea of treat others how you wish to be treated. The reality is we need to treat others how they wish to be treated. And that is how we show inclusion and acceptance and welcoming. When you adopt a beginner's mindset, you can accept that you are imperfect. It's a great thing. It's a great thing when you can stop holding yourself to perfection and really look at each opportunity as a learning chance, as a chance to grow, as a chance to nurture change and, <clears throat> and nurture understanding one another's experience. Challenge and lead. Speak up when you observe excluding and marginalizing language and behaviors. If you find yourself editing yourself within a set space and maybe showing up in one area different to how you show up in another, consider why that lack of congruence is so. Is it to protect your own inclusion? Is it that you feel that you will be rejected? Or is it that you don't know how to, spe how to speak up? Please, I challenge you to lead and to learn as you go. Have an awareness of assumptions and judgments. It's impossible not to have assumptions and judgments. Let me tell you, like, really, this is part of the human condition. We all have them. And it's about learning to recognize them and have an awareness of them. You do not need to edit or shame yourself. It is about recognizing what impact we are having if we project our assumptions and judgments onto others and learning to maybe ground ourselves in curiosity and understanding. I also invite you to have self-reflectivity, re <clears throat> which is the idea of bringing awareness to your own values and beliefs, learning that your values belong to you and that you need to work to understand in real time the larger patterns and dynamics and the systems at play because every person has established values that are going to be different, if not in conflict, to yours. The values you have are not concrete. Think about when you were younger, what was the most important thing? I mean, I think back and I'm going to say Smurfs. Smurfs were really important to me. Those little blue characters, I watched them in Chinese, I watched them in German, I watched them in English, and I think I watched them in French as well. This idea of how important it was to get to the television to watch Smurfs. Smurfs are not so important to me now. That being said, learning to open myself up to multiple languages still resides in me as a core value, being aware of the different nuances and aspects that language brings to us. So remember that your values are not concrete and you might want to consider whether they're truly yours. Values such as religion. I, I always bring attention to sex, politics, and religion because often we are handed down values from others that we haven't checked in to see if they really align with who we are. It's not about rejecting a value. It's about learning to exchange and to navigate values so that they are truly our own. You have the ability to hold on to, to exchange, and to let go of any value that doesn't serve you. And as human beings, we are designed to grow and change. I think at the end of the day, it's really important to recognize that the hard reality is it is a privilege to not have to worry about inclusion. If you are not concerned about inclusion, then you're abusing your privilege. Inclusion affects all of us. We are not all in the same boat. We are all in the same storm. And some are on super yachts while well, some have just one oar. Thank you all this evening for joining me in a brief journey of inclusion. And I invite any and all questions and us to open up a discussion because that's where it all starts. It's all about talking.
wow, <laughs> that's all I can say now. Uh, I had like goosebumps while we were talking. I had like tears on, on, on my eyes. And thank you, Ness, for being so open and like sharing with us all the, these experiences you had. I wish you wouldn't have at least half of them because, oh my God, I, I don't know if I would be able to, you know, go through life, like literally. <laughs> um, we, we don't have any questions yet in the chat. I don't know if someone has questions, would like to ask anything. Um, so our president, um, she asked, uh, you, if you, from what you know about the AEF, how can we do better? Really great question. Um, so I think um, where I'd start is making yourself visible as an inclusive organization. When I looked at your website, um, I noticed that uh, the About Us section went straight to about board members and programs and that sort of thing. I would really like to hear a bit about the values that your organization has and stands for and shares. And when you talk about who you are, we think back to when I shared about my lens, talking about more than just um, uh, accreditations and, and policies, but about who you are as people and what you want to be representing within your organization is a great way to show people that humanity aspect. Um, and when it comes to um, uh, small changes, um, things like adding pronouns. Um, I, I love bringing pronouns up because it opens up the conversation where, where people often turn to it and say, that's a trans thing. Um, what's really interesting is that showing pronouns, if you feel comfortable, actually is a very um, uh, forward-facing way of demonstrating that you are um, on an inclusive journey because there's not many ways that we can actually show people that we are an, uh, an organization that is going to embrace inclusive practices um, because for the disabled community, you don't really have that same thing, like, you know, putting up a symbol, putting up a note. So you'll find that a lot of the marginalized community, when they look to see whether an organization is inclusive, they'll look for rainbow flags or pronouns. And that's not even necessarily what group that they identify with, but it's an indicator. So I'd say that in terms of uh, your mission statement. I think also um, I'd suggest like integrating education. Um, so inclusive education into part of your curriculums and, um, and mandatory learnings for coaching as well as for community and athletes. And it can just be a, a small component, but if you start integrating that in so that it becomes part of your foundation building rather than an on top level, because at the end of the day, inclusion needs to be embedded into your system. Um, and I, you know, I started with this, uh, the deliver messaging, messaging that speaks to different inclusive practices. So celebrating, um, I guess, think about who's at your organization, who's at your table, and what, for example, what holidays, what traditions, what do people celebrate who are involved in your organization, whether it's harvest, whether it's solstice, these sorts of things. Um, and then when you start to create messaging, it shows that you are more than just the AEF, uh, feder like as a federation, it shows that you are human and that you're reaching to people. Um, and these are ways that, you know, I think orthodox business, we didn't used to function that way. Right. You know, we used to approach things as a we need to show who we are and show that we're serious and where things have moved to now is about showing that we're approachable and we're on board and we're flexible and we're in it for the people. Um, Ness, I do have a question for you uh, personally. Um, yeah. Like. I know you are a high performance athlete today, but let's talk to the Ness who was starting his career in sports, if you had, for example, like access to a directory of coaches and you were looking mm -hmm. for your first coach and you 
you know, you would have like access to see if that coach spoke different languages or if they were LGBTQ2 plus friendly, like even just as you mentioned, like a rainbow flag under their names or, you know, if they were able maybe to speak um, using signs, I don't know, like how much would that impact your choice? Would you still just look for their card credentials or uh, like, can you just elaborate on that please? Yeah, definitely. Um, it would hugely impact um, who I would be choosing to approach because uh, safety across many levels. So even if it's um, uh, someone speaking um, ASL, I would be more inclined to approach them. Um, and again, I said assumptions and judgments exist everywhere. I would be engaging, assuming that there would be some level of um, inclusion. I think um, being a trans individual, that gets a little bit more tricky in terms of safety. But, you know, in most, if not all of my other identities, um, it really plays a huge part. And I think... Um, you know, allow me to get into Mr. Statistics here because I was I was doing some work. Um, one of my other roles is I, I do inclusive marketing. Um, and so I was just pulling up my statistics and 64% um, of consumers take action after they see some sort of marketing that is inclusive. So they will take action towards your organization if you show that there is something, like if you show inclusive messaging. And... Um, 69% of organizations that demonstrate inclusive values saw a 44% increase in subscribers. So this, we, we know that um, showing inclusion matters. I think one of the 69% um, uh, of millennials, because you're looking at up and coming athletes, right? So 69% of millennials, and we're talking going on to gen alphas, are more likely to choose an organization that is inclusive over an organization that isn't. And so this is why these KPIs, key performance indicators really matter because there is a lot of fear that um, the, the myths that if we go inclusive, we're going to exclude a whole other sect. And where the world is moving to is that inclusion doesn't mean excluding someone else. It means creating a new welcoming space. And we're able to gain data now to recognize that it is the way forward that you're going to get greater um greater retention greater um uh, uh, exploration um and investment from new people if you can demonstrate yourself to be an inclusive organization so um i would also add to having whether it's uh symbols etc i would be very attracted to reading a blurb statement from coaches um, because I then want to go that one step further. I don't want it to be a platitude and you've just gotten a sticker and there you go. I want to know how does that person speak when they speak about how they approach coaching? Um, and so those kind of things matter, that human connection. Amazing. Um, Jason, uh, he's in our board of directors as well. He sent in the chat, NAS, our organization is reflected by a very white, very female membership. Can you please suggest a couple of concrete, simple first steps for us to introduce this to our barns, to our membership? Follow up. I love that our sport, not for deal, is pretty much gender neutral. What I sent to, San to Sandy. Mm, many of these are lessons that I have taught myself over the years and my career in indigenous relations. I think that we can use lots of these, but we need some help with action items. Okay. Um, I'm going to speak to that now, and then I'm actually going to, I'm going to take a, a shot of it. Actually. There we go. I'm taking a screenshot because I will actually follow up with uh, an email for that. Um, I think what's really important here, if I'm understanding the question, give me one second. You, you're watching me get like really unprofessional and testing and squinting in with my screen reader. Um, so. Okay. So what uh, can you um, elaborate on when you say to introduce this to um, 
our bonds to our membership. So you're saying you've got a very um, white female membership. Are you suggesting that you're wanting to expand that or you're wanting to highlight that? No, we want to expand that. Like we want to be more inclusive to everybody, anybody. Yep. Great. So then what you need to be doing is marketing across your platforms with intersectionality. That is your first step. So when you um, start advertising um, uh, like Instagram, Twitter, those sorts of feeds, you need to think about it, not just presenting who you are, talking to the people you want to reach. So for example, imagery, make sure you're getting intersectional imagery. Make sure you're getting photos that show a diverse uh, range of, um, uh, first of all, you know, riders. Um, you also that you're getting a diverse range of horses, that you're using things like uh, image description, uh, call outs, uh, stories about different, um, they may not be in your membership, but highlight stories of people elsewhere who are um, in those equity deserving groups and marginalized um, represent the marginalized community and highlight them so that you're actually showing that you are following this journey to reach out to a broader audience. Um, And why I say things like incorporating other areas, we spoke about um, one aspect um, indicates inclusion in another. So things like just starting to add in image descriptions um, when you're posting things is going to start indicating to people that you are, you know, you're thinking broader. Um, And when I say intersectional images, um, it needs to be more than one person in an image because if you are just showing uh, a person who can be put, like can be replaceable, that's just diversity. You need to be showing that you've actually invested in uh, intersectionality. So this idea of how are these people integral? Who, are, who is your community? Who are the people who are working the land, working the stables, looking after the horses? Who do you have in your organization? Because to be honest, people need to see visibility and see that they are represented to be attracted and feel safe to be drawn towards you. And if you don't have these people already in your community, then reach out and start inviting people to be a part of your organization who aren't fitting into what image you have right now. Because to, to change that image, you have to be letting people know that you want to change it. Awesome. Thank you. I, again, I, there is nothing else I can say. Uh, there is another question in the chat. Uh, it's from Dai Arojo. She says, listening to you today, I had the impression you had uh, speak up many times to stand your ground and be seen. How do you stand your ground and make sure you are seen and included, for example, in the workplace? Uh, Yeah, that's a (laughs) very astute of you. Yes, I I have had to do it many times. Um, To be honest, it is incredibly hard to advocate for myself. Um, That whole extrovert, introvert, I'll fight on behalf of anybody, on behalf of myself, has taken a lot of practice. And I think part of what helped me in my journey to it um, is recognizing that if I can stand up for this fight, for this advocacy, it's carving the way and protecting, protecting the next person who may not feel strong enough or have the tools to do it. And that really helped me to gain strength and to have that voice. Because it is, it's really hard when, when I'm the target of the pushback and I'm certainly identified as the problem rather than we have a problem. And I think um, uh, there, have been, there have been times when I have run low and really questioned it and that advocacy fatigue is real. I will say to you that something that helps me is gratitude practice and realizing I can always take a step away and with just a bit of a step away, I'm rekindled with the, why am I doing this? And it's really important because for the blind fight, I'm aware that I am, um, I am gifted with the lived experience that I was raised in a country where disabilities were championed. So being raised um, part in part in Australia, um, disability inclusion is huge there. Um, And I made the assumption it would be elsewhere. It wasn't here. And so I have skills 
to advocate for that. And I recognize doing that on behalf of my fellow Canadians is something that I can do for others. So long-winded, um, but very much, yeah, I realize it is hard and it is something that I try to do so that somebody else doesn't have to do it. Back to that title, I'm someone, so I'm just doing my best. Yeah, and I think that is just like, it means a lot for someone who is struggling, right? To be able to find someone that they can connect, like that they can be themselves and just, I don't know, like don't think about inclusion. Like I, I was talking to you early today and I was in a conference a couple months ago and they asked us what we wanted to see um, in the future of the sport as inclusion. And everybody was answering different things and I was thinking and I was like, well, I just don't want to have to talk about inclusion. Like, because it's just me, it's part of a sport. I don't have to talk about it because it's not a thing. Everybody is included, right? Yeah. So. Um, I think that is the, the dream. Um, and I'm very much for that. And we will, I say, you know, we, me and my, my great army, I believe we will all fight until that comes. Yeah. And I think I also want to say a nod to, you know, Everyone who's present here, please recognize that um, you know, whilst it was pointed out that I've had a lot of adversity, we all have identities that afford us power and privilege. So, you know, as, as a woman that, that puts you in a marginalized group, if, you know, if you're um, a, a man of a different background, like there's a marginalized group there, you know, there's this, this idea that there's a shaming and a guilting for privilege. And I really want to move those tethered narratives because at the end of the day the way that this this is going to work is for us all to leverage our privileged platforms remember i said that as a paralympian i have a privileged platform i can leverage that i do have privilege in life and i also have marginalized identities and there is no shame in having privilege and it's what we can do with that that helps foster things to be a better environment for everyone um, we have, I think this will be our last question. Um, Hannah is asking Ness, what gestures and experiences allow you to feel welcomed when experiencing a new community or environment for the first time? And if you don't mind, I want to have a peek on that answer. Uh, I, remember the first, <laughs> I remember the first time when I watched uh, Ness uh, doing his presentation and he told me like, the first thing I look for is actually the pronouns because they tell me if this is a safe space. And since then, I started using my pronouns in everything I can. And like, I'm not saying this is not a safe space, but it's just a simple gesture that you can do and will let other people know that, oh, this person at least knows why yeah. it's important to have their pronouns up, right? But please. I, I love that. And so to do the, you know, pronouns 101, by the way, uh, the way, the way, uh, you know, the, the community suggests, um, inclusive DI community suggests is any place that there's a last name, because um, we're trying to educate platforms to provide a space for pronouns, and they don't. So any place there's a last name, you just put your name and then your pronouns in brackets next to it. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think pronouns now, nowadays, are really important um, to me because I have so many um, intersecting identities of oppression. Um, there's a lot of fear um, and, and that comes about of me needing to protect my family too. So pronouns make a difference. Um, I think otherwise it's about the way people regard and listen and reflect. So, you know, if you're, if you're showing up for the first time, someone approaching me and saying, hi, like, you know, I'm so-and-so, looks like you're new, you know, let, you know, how about, you know, I show you around or like people taking the initiative to bring you in, um, you know, and, and, you know, if it's not a first meeting, it's, it's that idea of acknowledging people's existence in general, just the simple actions of, of recognizing that people are present uh, can really help people feel welcome and also personal shares. Um, we all need to get vulnerable 
uh, vulnerability is, is a superpower. It will feel uncomfortable. There is a thing called a vulnerability hangover. Don't worry, it passes. Um, when we can share um, things about ourselves, um, you know, this evening I shared a few things that I didn't have planned and it's, you know, Smurfs came up and I'm like, really, Ness, you mentioned Smurfs. Um, and it's this idea of it's all in essence of connecting. So I think it's the way that we regard one another and if regard versus guarded, that makes a big difference. Thank you, Nez, again, for sharing all of these. Um, thank you for trusting this safe space here to share everything. Uh, it was a great experience. I enjoy every opportunity I have uh, to talk to you because I always learn a lot. And for everybody that came and joined us, thank you very much for being here and listening to us. Uh, it was a pleasure. And I think the goal with this meeting was like, this subject is uncomfortable and we wanted to make you feel comfortable with the uncomfortable. So we brought in the blind trans guy. It just <laughs> makes perfect sense. <laughs> But you are amazing. You are the best. So, well, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone that stayed so long. And yeah, I I would like to second the thanks and say to all of you, realize you just did something for inclusion. You showed up. And that's you already on that journey. So thank you.